you, my friend, are now the co-host. Cool. So um, just for housekeeping, if you guys have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Katana and I will jam for like 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll just open it up to questions. I'm sure what we talk about here will spark some other questions as well. That's usually how it happens. So that is how we will roll tonight. And so the place I wanted to get started tonight is I was having a conversation earlier this week with someone and we were talking about um, basically the approaches that I see for demand generation across the board, mainly in B2B SaaS, it comes back down to basically two frameworks. The first framework is the serious decisions demand waterfall. And the second framework is, I, I guess, what I would consider like the terminus ABM framework. Those are the two that I see. Some companies mix them. Um, Gatano, you and I, I don't feel like follow either one. Um, and I just thought it would be interesting to kind of pick those apart, debate, you know, what parts of them are good. Cause we, I think we have kind of like a hybrid. Um, and so we'll just leave it open for you there to get going. Yeah, brother. Um, I think, I think it would be good if I, I, I was actually looking at the, um, the, uh, serious decisions, demand gen waterfall recently. It's funny you bring, bring it up. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll post it into, uh, or I could maybe just share my screen or something. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and we can go that way. Um, let me, let me do that. Let me do that. First of all, let me download this, uh, this image and then, um, I'll share my screen with everybody and we can just get into it. Oh yeah. Um, all right. Yeah. So I'm going to share my screen. All right. <clears throat> can you guys see this thing? This wonderful image of, uh, <laughs> the demand giant waterfall from, from serious decisions. And just to be fair, this is the rev one. I think they're at rev three now, but they're essentially the same. Yeah. I mean, so looking at it step by step, you have either inbound or outbound, which, you know, I don't, Chris, you tell me how you feel about this, but automate automation qualified leads. What are they trying to get at there? Are they trying to say that, um, you know, let's say someone completes a request demo submission form on a website and then there is a series of, you know, qualifying actions that happen through automation, or is that like uh, first touch from a from a SDR? Auto automation qualified lead, I assume, is whether you want to call it lead scoring or some type of qualification criteria that's automatically met, company size, or job title, or you know, conversion point, or something like that, automatically moves them to SAL. Yeah. And then the next term is called teleprospecting accepted leads. So that just goes to tell you what kind of frame of mind these people are in, right? I don't know who does anything called teleprospecting. <laughs> that just sounds fucked up. Uh, and then, you know, let's assume it gets all the way down to the sales qualified level. Um, you know, you probably have, like Chris said, there's a lead scoring engine or something that, that gives you uh, directional um, predictability as to who is ready for a sales conversation and who is not. We all know that a lot of those processes are, are um, directional at best and will never be the same as um, going right to, yes, I want a demo tomorrow, right? It will never, that, that will never, um, there's no replacement for that ever in my, in my view. Um, and then you have at the sales qualified level, um, sales accepted, sales qualified, and then closed <laughs> one, one business, right? Uh, and the problem with all of this stuff is actually, you know, if you're a, if you're a, somebody that does a lot of organic demand marketing, um, the problem is that let's say they search for a term like um, cloud phone system and they go to um, a blog article about the pros and cons of a cloud phone system. And then after that, they read it, um, they X out, then maybe they go back to the search bar again and they start uh, searching for specific features of a cloud phone system. And then they, they, so they search cloud phone system features, and then they, they go to another blog article that they find from Nextiva about this subject. 
Um, and then they go and search cloud phone system providers or best cloud phone system for whatever. Then they go to like one of, one of our affiliate sites that have Nextiva listed there along with Ring Central, Vonage, 8x8, Dialpad, Aircall, all the big ones. And um, the reason why they will click Nextiva from that affiliate site is because they already were familiar with the brand through the researching phase because they found all that top and mid funnel content. And then through the affiliate site, they click through to Nextiva and then they convert on the, um, on the page that corresponds back to the affiliate source and they sign up for a demo that way. The problem with the traditional waterfall here is attribution because in fact, um, you will not be able to see on the scorecard that, um, the first touch was a week ago when they were searching for pros and cons of a cloud phone system. So um, th that's just the top of mind thing that, that I think about when I see things like this, because it, what it shows here is a very linear, very linear process where in fact um, what this suggests is like, let's say that searcher went to pros and cons of a cloud phone system. They uh, opted into some white paper from there. And then through a series of, you know, webinar offers and quote unquote nurturing, which is really a term for when a mom has a baby and is breastfeeding, right? Like that's really what nurturing is to my ears, not for someone who's going to buy software and, um, you know, makes it through this, this funnel and then they eventually buy. Um, so I'll pause there and allow for some reaction, but I, I, I strongly feel that this, you know, is a very small fractional way of looking at the world and um it, it has evolved quite a lot since this came out so i'll pause there and allow for some reaction yeah so the first thing that i think about when i look at this diagram is the marketing qualification box um which involves a ton of activity once you get to teleprospecting a ton of activity and not a lot of results if you look at it, like I'm sure people trickle through and get to sales accepted, but the move from somebody that downloaded a white paper to you going outbound to them to sales accepted to moving through this process, I find is very low efficiency. And so, and the second piece is that this, like the inbound outbound in the top right, I'm not sure what the outbound is signaling, but that sounds like sales generated uh, that's halfway down at the bottom. And so my feeling is that this is just, overcomplicated and I think it's one of the core reasons why companies are driven on volume of leads like the post that I made this morning about content syndication and I'm, I know that we have the same views on that one G and white paper downloads paying to promote them or webinars that then you do teleprospecting just like this thing prescribes you to do and so I think that this framework has driven a lot of poor behavior to people that aren't actually leads. I, I mean, we're 100% aligned. The question then becomes, is there ever a scenario where some of these um, theories or philosophies on marketing actually are valid or warranted? And, um, you know, to, you and I, Chris, are pretty much 100% aligned on the fact that if your company is doing white papers, you should just do them for um, uh, trust building. Brand, and, yes. And for brand and for value building. Um, you're making deposits without expecting anything in return. I mean, you would never go, you would never be going to a cocktail party, hold the door open for somebody and said, okay, I held the door open for you. Now, what are you going to do for me? <laughs> right? Like you would hold the door open for them and say, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Right. And you would just say, all right, that was the right thing to do. I added value to someone I didn't know and I was being polite and friendly. And now they will see me as someone slightly more positive. Right. And that is the way I also look at things like webinars and, and white papers and research and things like that is you should not do them for quote unquote lead gen. Um, you should do them for providing value. And then, you know, these are, these are the things that, as we always say, Chris cannot be 100% um, attributed, right. Or trackable. Mm -hmm. um, but perhaps there are cases where lead scoring could work. Right. And that maybe is things like um, when uh, prospects do sign up for a free trial on your website and your, and your free trial 
has a series of, of components to it. And there's a certain life cycle of that free trial. And there's things happening during that free trial stage, right? Like that, I think, is an area where it might make sense to do um, usage-based nudging. So, for example, if they meet a certain, um, a certain level of product usage during that free trial stage, it's a nudge to sales to reach out or at least offer help, right? That's the way it should be framed. Um, but, you know, at the, at the very top funnel stage where, like, you know, you're doing things like white papers and webinars and templates and downloadables and this and that, the HubSpot model, um, you know, it, you, you get into a real mess when you start trying to, you know, predict when is the right time for sales to reach out after someone downloaded a white paper mm. and it just gets really messy. For sure. So why don't we, uh, why don't we drop the diagram so I can see that cool background you got behind you and, um, and let's go in the other direction now. So that is the core framework that most companies operate on. On the other side, there's companies that are operating some type of like, I don't know if it's terminus prescribed, but like basically they, they did that, the, the ABM program. And so why don't you get us started on, on that one? I think that that makes sense for a certain type of company. There are components of that system that I agree with and disagree with. And so why don't we jam on that side? Yeah, let's, let's do that. Um, so, so basically it's the inverse funnel. I'm going to bring it up. Uh, it looks like um, Terminus or uh, one of these flip my funnel companies have, have came up with this. Um, I think it was actually, yeah, it was Terminus Sangram. So um, I'm going to pull this one up as well, guys, and uh, we can jam on this for, for a second. Um, let me just get this pulled up here. MarTech advisor, flip my funnel. Here we go. Yeah. And then while he pulls it up, I think it's interesting as, as a starting point here to look at the available frameworks and what I've always gotten the most value out of is looking at how people are doing it, taking the things that I like, removing the things that I don't and building my own system. And so those, that's kind of like a, a starting point for why we're looking at some of this stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, th so this one, the idea is that, um, let's, I say, I think the left model is different in the right in that in the left, what you are doing is you're casting a huge wide net. You're fishing for shrimp, as they say, and you're getting a lot of top, top funnel volume. Um, and this can work if you have, uh, um, let's say, uh, a, a, a product that's not super ridiculously expensive. So, you know, Nextiva obviously falls into this category where, um, you know, the average value for a contract is, is around a thousand dollars. Right. Um, whereas like some very expensive SaaS companies, um, could be upwards of 30,000, 40,000 in that range. But typically, um, when the trend, when the transactions are higher velocity and lower cost, you can build an inbound flow. Um, that kind of has that old school AIDA or awareness, interest, consideration, purchase. But what um, Terminus and Flip My Funnel and all these companies are advocating now on the right side is um, if you have an expensive product, that old school model doesn't work. Well, I guess they call it old school, but the reality is if you have a, an inbound machine like Nextiva, it actually does work. But really what I think this is getting at is like, what is the product that you're selling, how niche is your market, how wide is your TAM, um, what's your sales velocity, right? Like all these sorts of things I think matter a lot, how crowded is your space. And um, the left side can work if you're a company like Nextiva where, mm -hmm. um, you know, the uh, market has only been cracked at about 20%. There's still 80% of businesses of all sizes that need to move from on-premise phone systems to cloud phone systems. There's a lot of industries right now where on-premise to the cloud, there's a lot of movement happening there. But um, I do think if you're in a, in a, in a vertical, like let's say um, like e-learning or cloud, cloud SaaS for, for e-learning, um, it is expensive and it is not a huge SEO, SEM play mm -hmm. because there's not a lot of search volume for the, for the uh, keywords that your, your business is going after. So you do have to go inverse and go... Um, you know, kind of spear hunting instead of uh, shrimp fishing. So um, I'll, I'll pause there. That's just kind of some initial thoughts. But Chris, I, I think you can maybe reflect on some of these ideas. Yeah. So if you look at the chart on the right, the ABM framework that's there, that's existed forever. It's called account-based sales. So when there was 
people in the field in the 1980s selling copiers, this is the approach that they took. They identified the 20 accounts that they could sell to and they went in and they engaged them and they tried to be, have them become customers. And so what we've done here is we've layered on a marketing component to it where sales and marketing decide what companies that we're going after, let's pretend it's a hundred accounts. And then the marketing team is prescribed to run ads to those different accounts. Some people that do it say that you need to run, you need to have 10,000 display impressions in that account before you start going outbound and then they're more receptive to it. Who knows whether or not that's correct. I don't believe that, but that's what some people say. Um, and then after you show the ads, you basically are just full on outbound sales. I think, I mean, that is my impression of that model. And so a couple of the reasons that I like it is that if you have a really expensive product, I think that the, the bar to whether or not you should consider an account based program is somewhere between 50 and a hundred K average annual contract value. And so if you're selling, most companies are not going to fall under that. If you're selling a 30 K ACV product, you have a wide, like a wide target audience. You're selling mid-market SMB. There's so many people. If you're selling super enterprise, there's only a thousand accounts that could ever buy from you. Then this approach um, may make sense. I disagree with some of the tactics from the marketing side that are prescribed, but in general as a framework, picking the accounts that you can reasonably sell to if they're small and then going after them seems like a re seems like a pretty good idea. Um, and so those are my kind of initial thoughts on the ABM one. Yeah, I, I, I like that. Um, I, I actually think the ABM approach is a lot easier um, just because typically when you're going like hardcore ABM like this, uh, it's because the search volume that like the search, the search engine opportunities are usually way less when you, when you're going this route. Um, and that means less tactical competitive things are happening. Like you don't have to spend a ton of time trying to rank for a really hard term. You can really just get into that persona based marketing, go real, go real hardcore on content and messaging and it becomes less about, um, you know, how to, how to defeat the algorithms and more about how to connect with those, with those target individuals within the accounts that you're trying to, uh, trying to break into. Um, but I, I think we can maybe, maybe wrap up on this one. I think we're aligned here. Yeah. Yeah. And so my, my thought from here is some value for people is like, what are the, com like, how do you, cr how did you create your demand? Like your framework? Do you, are you based off of I mean, it seems like you fall more in the camp of the serious decisions one. And obviously you've taken some things out. And so I'm trying to like reverse engineer for people how you got to the approach that you take. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so basically here's the other thing. And I think we talked about this last week, Chris, but essentially the kind of marketer that you are or, or even sales, like the kind of marketer or salesperson that you are and what you're good at should align to the kind of companies you work with. Mm. And I think that's like the, the, the takeaway here, right? Like yeah. I'm great at building inbound engines. So I'm going to lend preference to a company that has lower ACV, bigger TAM, um, good search volume around the, around the key terms that they're trying to win. Um, pretty competitive space in terms of content marketing and brand, right? Um, I probably wouldn't want to go somewhere where like there's two giants in the space and there's not really anyone else. It's just two giants trying to battle for, for a niche vertical, like say gung versus chorus. Like that to me wouldn't be as exciting. I'd rather go somewhere where, you know, it's a little more dynamic. Um, not to say that I wouldn't be successful if I went that route. Like, actually, I think that would be interesting to force me to not go to my, my go-to tactics, but you know, basically for me, the story has been, I, I go places where there's huge amount of opportunity with SEO and SEM and then landing page optimization and some of the more, um, tactical demand gen approaches. Um, but that's just me and you have to decide as a marketer, what are you great at? Where can you have tremendous influence on the bottom line and what do your kind of core values as a marketer align to from 
like the product that you're trying to market, the company that you're trying to do work with, and you know, the, ultimately the kind of customers you're trying to identify with and, and, you know, resonate with, like all that matters a lot. So for me, it's just been aligning my strengths to the kinds of companies I work with. And I, and I feel like Chris, that's kind of been your story as well. Yeah, for sure. So maybe we can drop the screen share. This Jira display ad got way more than the one cent they paid to put it there. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the one time display works. <laughs> yeah, Jira just got tons of free promo. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the only other thing I, I'm totally aligned with what you're saying. The only other thing that I would add is I, as a marketer, love marketing in spaces where you're at a company that has a disruptive product and you're competing with the five billion dollar gorilla because the big gorilla moves slow, doesn't innovate, doesn't try new things. And that's where, I mean, you and I, when we were debating the idea of what to call this, we were going to call it underdog marketing, because I think that's what we do. Like, um, just be scrappier and smarter, and work harder. And just like overall, you know what I mean? Totally. And that's why I enjoy Nextiva because we are the challenger brand. That's another thing too. You have to decide if you want to be a part of the challenger brand or you want to be the incumbent, right? So for us, you know, the incumbent is Vonage and Ring Central. And with, with companies like Vonage, you know, they're running out of ideas. They're, they're doing ads right now that say it's a, they're literally their ads right now are jingles of like some like, um, farmers, dun, 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 dun. they're copying that route and they're going, um, our APIs are as easy as pie. And then they have a guy <laughs> eating pie. <laughs> it's 15 cool. second and it's cringe. It's pure cringe. Right. And I see that and I'm like, you know, <laughs> like that, that's just, a, that's a sign of, of, you know, of company that's running out of ideas. Uh -huh. Right. So, um, I would rather, like Chris said, be that scrappy small guy uh in the battle of david versus goliath and you know really show them what we're made of right uh find the weaknesses uh, hit them from the back of the hamstrings type stuff mm -hmm. and um you know just kind of go laser laser uh targeted and 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 win that way go long tail do the things they're not doing right um and, and be different and win that to me is more exciting than say joining the the evil empire Right. Like I would never go work for Salesforce or HubSpot or any company that's already at the top. Mm -hmm. So that's just me. Cool. So we got a, uh, we got two questions that came in, um, before the, um, before the episode. And so if anyone has questions, especially like we kind of jammed on the demand waterfall and things, if you have detailed questions on that, I think that would maybe be most helpful given that framework, but we'll jump into two quick questions right now. The first one is, um, there's, I'm seeing an increase in the amount of Instagram ads. How can B2B companies capitalize on it? Um, Chris, that's all you, brother. Yeah, so I'll take this one really Thoughts easily. On this, but I think that's all you for the, for the first take. Yeah, so, so before COVID happened, we were paying somewhere between 2 and $3 CPM for Instagram story ads. That means they get shown a thousand times for 2 or $3. It's a, good, it's a good buy for Instagram stories. However... Now that COVID happens, e-commerce companies are making a lot more money and they are bidding. And when we are bidding in a social platform, we compete with everybody. So Susie, who might be the CFO at the company we're trying to sell to, might also want to buy the Volvo or do these different things. So they're a target for every company. And so as companies are seeing success with Instagram story ads, we're seeing CPMs right now that range from 8 to $13. And at eight to $13, the, the deal is not as good. And so my suggested approach would actually be to, to push away from Instagram story ads right now, because I think that they're overpriced and you're competing with a lot of like e-commerce companies. And the funny thing about e-commerce companies is you can feed back the sales data into the platform and let the algorithm optimize for more sales. And so um, it is incredible what it can do, but it'll go and you give it 50 sales a day and it'll go out in the next day and find you the next 50 people that are going to buy. And so as long as your CAC makes sense from an LTV standpoint, like companies are going to continue to buy those and put more money into them. Um, a lot more so, especially in an e-commerce world on Instagram than on Facebook, because their buyers on Instagram, they're targeting are 20 to 45. And most of the people that we hit on Facebook are 40 to 65 plus. And so um, that was a long winded answer. The short answer is I would actually 
move budget away from Instagram stories right now because they're three, four, five times expensive, more expensive as they used to be. Right on, brother. I, I was going to also just add one thought to that, which is it all comes down to what you want them to do. Mm. It all comes down to what you're offering and like what, what is that conversion goal for you? Um, and for a lot of companies, what I've seen work in B2B SaaS is actually um, retargeting on paid social to a free trial from product feature and pricing pages. Mm. Right. And that is, that is a pretty logical approach. If you think about it, right? Like they went to a, a, a pretty decent intent page on your site, features, products, pricing, stuff like that. Integrations, maybe um, they maybe didn't convert. Um, you follow them around to a free trial. Hey, you, you know, uh, explainer video and value props and all that sort of stuff. Light, light sort of page there if you're if you're um using a cta that says learn more and then they go to a landing page like that right it has to obviously be mobile optimized and stuff but i think uh that can work um where i think where a lot of companies kind of get lost is they go for get a demo like instagram ad to get a demo is real tough real tough um i know we don't do that but for all the reasons chris said yeah um but i just don't know of anyone i don't i have never actually heard a story of any company that has said, yeah, we're running, you know, Instagram ads to, to demo pages and, and we're getting a lot of good juice there. <laughs> like you just, you just don't work. hear that happening. Um, so you got to think about what is the purpose of you even doing B2B Instagram ads? Like, what are you trying to do? Um, in terms of really impacting pipeline at best, I think you're going to have traction with a free trial. If it's a, if it's a low kind of, you know, investment of time and effort from a product standpoint, like a, like a sales CRM, like a pipe drive, I think makes sense. But if it's something really big and expensive, you should probably just stay away from it. Um, and if you're going white papers and stuff for Instagram to like, you know, top of funnel reports and stuff like that, um, you know, you're just basically paying for brand at that point. Um, and you have to be willing to accept that. Yeah. And just one more thing. When the, when the Instagram stories cost two or three dollars CPM, we were running ads of a 15 second video. And if they got through 10 seconds of the video, that was worth the two cents I just paid. And so there's th that's the type of granularity that we need to get to is like, if somebody clicks and reads my blog and I track it by scroll depth that they got to the end of the page and I can see the time on page was a certain thing and they actually read it and it cost me 33 cents for that click, then that's worth the price. Um, so yeah, that's the last thing. Okay, we got an awesome question from Josh. Josh, let me in here so you can actually ask it yourself. I'm going to hit you unmute right now. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hey guys, so uh, for, for either, either one of you just had a question on what you guys were talking about before where you're, you're essentially uh, the, the, the small guy in the room going up against the, the, the big monster. How would you guys approach that uh, David versus Goliath scenario in the payroll software world where, you know, ADP and paychecks are just absolute monsters and they dominate everything with marketing. Love it. That's a great one. Um, well, <laughs> there's so many things. You can do. <laughs> um, there's so many things you can do. <clears throat> um, and it all kind of depends on really what, what is, what are, what are you, what are you after? Um, and, um, you know, the way I kind of think of this, like the first thing that comes to mind for me immediately when I, when I hear this is like, um, we need to find areas where they're bad and exploit. We need to find areas where they're bad and exploit. And there's a lot of this and a great example of this is content marketing. And when I think about content marketing um, in a world where you have a couple of giants and then everyone else is, um, you know, let's say worms. Um, if you're the worm, there are definitely scenarios where um, ADP may be ranking highly in Google search for like a very um, important term, but the content is really thin. The only reason they're ranking well is because they have brand, but the content sucks. So when I was at Sales Hacker, we outranked HubSpot really easily for some important terms like cold calling, sales operations, sales development, B2B 
because our content was higher quality, more authentic, had um, a better tone of voice. It was written by real experts in the field rather than just content writers, which, you know, it's no secret that companies like ADP, they go and, you know, they source out con content writers who are not necessarily experts in, you know, financial and payroll and stuff like that. Um, and they rank because they have huge domain authority and huge brand authority. So you can exploit them by finding long tail opportunities. Um, and you can exploit them by finding uh, low quality content that you can reproduce at a higher level than them. Um, that's, that's one area that stands out to start. I mean, I could keep going, but Chris, I'll, I'll pass it to you. Maybe we can zigzag on this a little bit. Yeah. The first thing that comes to mind for me is to figure out who has the most affinity to buy your product instead of theirs and then focus there. And so maybe it's companies that are predisposed to having being more technology driven or whatever, figure out what that segment is and then start marketing specifically to them. So I don't know if you're asking about Gusto. Um, but Gusto is like a small competitor to ADP and Paychex, more for SMB. Um, and so where I would, when I look at those types of companies, I'll give you a story. I work for a company, it was a $30 million company. We were competing with a $5 billion global organization. Um, and that company was spending $250,000 to put on a little symposium at a conference where 50 people showed up. And... They had a massive sales force and they locked customers into five-year contracts and all these different things. And when I only had a budget of $5,000 a month, I was just running content on Facebook ads in 2015 to the exact people that wanted to buy that we needed. There was 50,000 respiratory therapists in the US. And so it was not that expensive at $6 CPM to hit all of those people on a weekly basis. And over the next 12 months, we got 76 new hospitals that you that switched from that company to ours just by marketing in a really inexpensive way. And then we scaled from there. I think we, you also need to look, um, Gatano mentioned this, at where they're weak. And so when I look at the big gorillas, they waste a lot of money in ineffective places. They have a ton of money tied up in sales. And so like, how are you going to be smarter from a buyer experience standpoint? How are you going to win? Like if your example was about Gusto, like I signed up to Gusto. When I signed up for the free trial, someone called me. It was a delightful experience and I'll be with them forever. Like ADP actually called me a couple, a couple months ago and I was like, I'm good. I'm not like not interested. And so I think you win in two fronts is really taking care of your customers and making them evangelists and then just being smarter about how you market. Because most of those big companies are not even reaching the people that they want to. They're the people aren't paying attention in the places that they're marketing. Totally. Totally. I, I, I thought of another dirty little trick. Uh, yeah, yeah. This one's real nasty. This one's filthy, but you guys are going to like this one. Go read their reviews. Mm. Go look at their worst reviews and look for patterns and trends. What kind of people are talking about them in negatively? Why do they consistently fail? Right? And start to identify patterns and trends there. Then what you want to do is bid against their brand terms carefully, but you want to do this. You want to build competitor content. You want to build your brand versus their brand landing pages. And let's say through those negative reviews, you are noticing that it tends to be smaller businesses that are complaining. So what does that tell you? ADP is probably ignoring the small, the small guys right? They're going upstream hardcore. They only care about the big fish. If you're small, you're worthless, right? Um, then you can put your targeting, your audience targeting on smaller businesses. You can bid against their, um, against their branded keywords, uh, ADP pricing, ADP features, whatever, um, and adjust your target, your audience targeting settings to align with the types of people that are complaining right? And then exploit their weaknesses on that comparison content. Oh, uh, frequent outages. Um, they rely on third party tools because they don't service the things that you need, you know, in house, right? Like find where, whatever it is, find the list of five, six, seven things. We have, we have superior support. Uh, we have no outages in the last X years. 
um, show all your positive reviews where there's are you know, you obviously can't take negative screenshots of their reviews and put that on the page. I don't think you can do that, but you can hammer home your value versus what the weaknesses are based on their reviews. And you can start, you know, chipping away at them that way. Right. And then that's, and I'll tell you that that's a pretty, that that's toxic right there. That's venom. They're going to see that they're, they're going to say, Oh shit, they're not playing games. That's, that's like some, that's some serious stuff right there, a serious business. Um, and not a lot of companies have the smarts to do that or the balls, but you started doing that and you're going to start hitting them where it hurts. Uh, the other thing is right there on reviews, build up your reviews better than theirs. Mm. Drive reviews, drive reviews, drive them hard, focus on advocacy and retention. And once you start getting higher volume of reviews, uh, more in depth, better quality of reviews, and you spread that ac- across all the sites that matter, you know, the software advices of the world, get apps, Captera, wherever it is, uh, G2, wherever it is that has a lot of um, topical authority and presence in that vertical and that space that you're in, you need to find the top review site in that space and do anything you can to, to be their best friend and win on those review sites. That's going to be key. Just one last thought that I think is interesting is you, no matter what those companies are not producing good content. I know this for sure. ADP is busy spending a hundred thousand dollars to make some promotional video that nobody cares about. And during that time you can make a hundred high quality videos that matter to the person that you're trying to sell to and just win that way. Like you don't, we don't actually need budget. We just need an effective organic strategy really. Um, and then you use budget to augment it. So, um, some different ideas, Matthew, this kind of dives into some of your questions. So I'm going to unmute you and you can, uh, we can jump that way. I think I got Oh, man. Uh, Gaetano, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your PPC approach for like search engine marketing on, I'm thinking in particular about if you're a new company and it's um, uh, keyword, keyword volume is okay. It's like in the you know, three to 4,000 a month. Um, but if they kind of sell like one thing, so it'd be like, customer retention or they'd be competing against like a Dunning service or something like that. And I'm, I'm curious how you would approach uh, a paid search strategy around something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, really what it comes down to is starting small and incrementally scaling once you find something that works. And um, really what it comes down to is how like first of all it also depends on the uh the cost per clicks right that does actually dictate quite a lot because um in let's the world in the 15 let's say it's in the 15 dollar range what's the all ACV? Right, so, yeah what? what's the acv of the product Ooh, i don't know the answer to that honestly let's just assume it's 5k for the sake of the conversation okay yeah so if it's 5k really what it comes to what Chris is getting at and what I'm ultimately getting at is like, you have to think about how, what's your threshold as a company in terms of what you're willing to spend to acquire a customer. That's really what it comes down to. What is your threshold there? Are you willing to lose money because you're early stage and you just need traction? So there is a such thing as negative revenue. Like you're going to lose money on a deal just because you need that logo. Like that's, that is a potential scenario. It depends on how early in the infancy this company is. Um, the other thing is, you know, you have to really start thinking about not just pipeline and, and revenue, but like, do these customers stick around? Is this a good fit in terms of this type of customer? Right. Um, I think it's kind of dangerous to assume that uh, you you found a good keyword and you know, because your competitors are all over it, that you should also be in that conversation. But if you can't hold up your end of the bargain from a product standpoint, um, you're going to have to abandon that ship. But ultimately, what it always comes down to when you're starting off, especially, is just this under, you know establishing baselines around how expensive is it going to be to acquire a customer? How much are we willing to bleed? And uh, you know what is ultimately that ratio of, of spend to 
stickiness that you're looking to hit. Um, and when you're first starting out, I think if you're, if you're breaking even that, that, that's pretty great, right? You want to at least aim to break even like most companies are, ble- are losing tremendously. Most companies are losing so, so much money because here's, here's the, the bad part about it is, you know, they're venture funded. So they suddenly have all this excess money and then, um, they get sloppy. Um, and they, and they, they feel that with, you know, all that excess money they have, it allows more leeway to make mistakes. But the reality is you need to treat this as if you're not venture funded, even if you are, where it's your own money coming out. And, um, if you know, you're bleeding, um, you need to figure out why. So that's, I mean, I can keep going, but I'll pause there, Chris. I know you probably have some thoughts as well. Yeah. Some things were that I think about from a a paid search and I set them up for accounts. One thing is focus on the three highest intent keywords first, optimize landing pages for those, and then start collecting data initially. Um, I like to start small too. I also like to focus on the things that actually matter. So a lot of people will build a big account with a bunch of feeder keywords. And if you're like trying to get started, that can be really inefficient and expensive. So you'll probably be underwater at the beginning. It depends on how you want to do it. If you want to learn as fast as possible, then the feeder campaigns are the way to do it. If you want to be efficient and show positive ROI right out the gate, then you're more likely going to lean toward just having the intent-based keywords and optimize a couple landing pages. Another thing that I've, I mean, we talked about the math, but another thing that I'd offer is that like for some companies, paid search doesn't make sense. And so you can get that through, you know, trial and error and fit and then collecting the data and being like, look, we're paying a thousand dollars a lead. We're closing those at 5%. Our CAC is 20 K our product costs 5 K. This doesn't make sense. And so there are a lot of companies that never look at it at that level. Like they're getting $500 leads and they're like, yeah, this is great. $500 leads, but they don't recognize that they're winning those deals at 1% and their CAC, their lead cost is $500, but their CAC is $50,000. And so um, that's something to consider as well is that maybe there's a better avenue than paid search. Like I would argue that paid search ends up becoming like a, like for most companies, a secondary or tertiary strategy behind some others. Yeah. I, I don't know many companies that are doing paid search extremely well and that are like profitable all across the board. I think there's a lot of companies doing paid search right now that have no idea how their dollars are being spent and what the return on that spend mm-hmm. is looking like. And they're doing it because quote unquote, this is the way it's always happened, or this is what we've always done. We need to fulfill volume, right? That pipeline needs to be fat and juicy, but you know, here's another problem. Um, you may have some ad groups that target small businesses. Let's say, let's say your product can serve small and large businesses. You may have some ad groups where, um, you're, you're targeting small businesses and you may be doing well with those but you may be doing horribly with the ad groups that are targeting larger buyers or more sophisticated buyer types. And if you're only looking at front end metrics, you may be seeing things like clicks, impressions, cost per click, uh, landing page conversion rates even. And you may see that um, for like the enterprise ad groups that you are actually getting a pretty decent cost per conversion, right? Meaning they got to the landing page and they converted on the form. They've completed that form, which says, yes, I want someone from sales to follow up me and give me more information. But guess what? It was the CIO of um, Bank of America and he or she is extremely busy. And even though that person completed the form, sales cannot figure out how to contact this person because they keep calling, but that CIO is always in meetings. They keep sending email follow-ups, but that CIO is buried in emails they sent LinkedIn connection requests and LinkedIn emails, but guess what? That CIO is buried in spam. So um, what's the plan then when you spent a lot of time and money to get that CIO of bank of America to submit that form, but you can't get in touch with that CIO. Right. Um, And these are the things that come to mind when you're spending money to get leads essentially, because if you're not getting feedback from sales and that's the problem that keeps happening where you're getting big fish to come in, but you can't get in touch with them. Or even when you do make contact with them, you got some junior P brain SDR that doesn't know anything and is not high business acumen and can't, you know, speak, uh, at the, um, CIO level, you know, in terms of, um, uh, knowledge of the industry and so forth. 
and that CIO gets very turned off and says, you know, I'm not dealing with this company. What's, what, what's the point of this? I get it. Discovery call, ask me some questions that even when I tell you the answer, you're not going to know what it means. I'm going to have to repeat all that same information again to an AE. Then when I get on the phone with an AE, what's that person going to do? Oh, I need to get a sales engineer to show you the demo because I can't do it. I'm just an AE that, sh- that sends you the proposal and gets the close and gets the money. So, so, so you have a sales process that is not conducive to closing big business. It's completely broken. So you're trying to go upstream and get big fish with paid, paid ads. Um, and you're spending a lot to acquire leads, but on the backside of that, your company is not equipped to, to, to speak with and handle and manage the CIO of bank of America. And on the front side, it's, it's looking, oh man, look at what a great job marketing did. We got the CIO of Bank of America. On the back side of that, yeah, well, it's worthless. Can't do anything. Don't know how to sell to him or her. Sorry. <laughs> right? So yeah. that's the problem. That's for, the problem. Uh, for, I, I know that this is going to, we put this up on a podcast. I don't know if any of you subscribed. If not, I, I mean, you guys are here live, so I'm not sure if you'd get value out of it, but I know a lot of people are going to listen to this. Here's one thing that I consistently see when I go in and we're either taking over or we're auditing an AdWords campaign, where if you listen to this and you just check it, it might expose some real issues for you. So I would encourage you to do it, which is that when you go in to your AdWords campaign, if you have an agency running it, click on the button called tools and then look at conversions and look at how they set up the conversions. And so we took over an account last month, we went in there, the metrics look great. Cost per conversion was $2. And what was the most highest performing conversion metric? Time on site. <laughs> if the person was on the site for 30 seconds, it was considered a conversion. So they were over there looking like they won. Right. And the ads were broad targeted stuff and people just barely made it across 30 seconds on the page. And that's, so I would really, really encourage you to look at that. I, I am blown away by how many agencies and other external partners still use that type of metric to quantify some type of conversion, even intent. Like if they viewed the demo page, I don't think that's yeah. a conversion. That should not be factored into your cost per conversion. Yeah, yeah, no, nah, the agents, agencies are notorious for pulling moves like that. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the more green marketers just don't know it. So they're being fed that kind of information at face value. And unless, you know, someone's asking the difficult questions like, wait a second, all these goal conversions, what, what, what goal conversion is that? What does that mean? <laughs> right? It could be white paper downloads, right? You could be paying big money on paid search for white paper downloads that are just going into a massive black hole. Nothing's I've seen that too. That. $300, $300 cost per conversion for a top of the funnel white for paper. For a top of the funnel white paper, right? So unfortunately, what Chris is saying is that whenever he or his company goes into a Google ads account, they're almost always able to cut spend significantly on things that are not moving the needle and the output is the same in terms of pipeline, right? So <laughs> it's not unusual to be, you know, going into a Google ads account, auditing it and saying, all right, well, we could probably cut 30, 40, 50% of spend and it's not even going to do anything in terms of negative impact on pipeline and um, proposals and revenue. So um, that's just the reality. Right on. So we got uh, Ashley's question and, there was like a couple of people that put plus one in there. So we'll get to Ashley's. And then after that, we'll get to yours, Evan. Hey, okay. I have a lot of background noise. So You're uh, good. if you want to cut me out and read it, you can. Um, we recently found out that Captera uses one of our products. It's a bug and issue tracker that also has like some project management in it. And apparently they've been really happy for years. I'm curious if they even commit to testimonials or case studies because they're a software review site. Um, and I want to figure out the best way to start a relationship with them and leverage their happiness. So just strategy. Mm. How would you go about that? What would you do? Cool. I think we'll get some creative ideas on this one. Yeah. So to summarize the question, is it, how do you build a good relationship with uh, Captera because they're customers of yours and then how do you user use and then leverage their, their brand to promote your product? Oh, <laughs> you know, I think it's a simple, all right. So here's what I think it comes down to actually. Um, 
I really do think it, that like marketers and businesses like tend to overcomplicate this, but I really do think it's as simple as asking for a, a quick 15 minute conversation and say, and just lay it all out there. Just say, look, you guys are customers. We, we you know, we're looking to do some co-marketing with great brands. Here's what we could commit to in terms of, you know, putting resources behind the co-marketing campaign. Would this be interesting to you guys? How can we make it, how can we make this a deeper relationship? Here's the kind of audience we can touch, you know, here's how big our email list is, right? Like start talking about what you can bring to the table, something, you got to find something. You can't just say, Hey, I need you to promote our product because you're a customer. They're not going to do it. They're going to say, why, why should we do that? What's in it for us? It's always about what's in it for us. What's in it for them. That's what they want to know. So if you can think about before you ask, how can you, you know, make some kind of deposit or at least come to the table with a deposit or two ready to go. Um, that's going to be much more compelling. Cause I'll tell you, I get emails almost every um, day at, w- with marketers and other companies asking me to include them in the articles that I've written on Nextiva that are ranking highly. And I ask them, okay, what's in it for me? Why should I do it? <laughs> And they say, well, um, it will be a great r- resource for your, for your readers. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm, the, I'm a great resource to the readers. They came to see me, not you. <laughs> right? Like, what does that mean? That I'm, already, <laughs> I'm already great. <laughs> right? They found my content. They're reading my content. What, what do you have to do with it? Right? So, in short, they didn't bring anything to the table for me, so I'm not going to do it especially if I don't know them. Now, if they're a homie and it's different and, and you know, they're just asking straight up for a favor, all right, that may be a different story. Um, but in your case, you know, just the fact that they're a customer still isn't quite enough for them to want to promote you and, and, and all that sort of stuff. So you got to think of something that you can bring to the table that's exciting for them. And, and then maybe you'll get somewhere. Chris, I don't know if you have any other thoughts. Here's what I would do. I would go in there. I imagine there's multiple users in the account. Um, I would sort it by most usage. I would pick the top five or 10, depending on how many people are inside of that account. So let's just pretend there's a hundred people at Captera using it. I would take the top 10. I'd look at them. I would go onto LinkedIn. I would see if it, there's any, if I find anything interesting, some things that I'd be looking for is has this person been promoted in the past, blah, 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 amount of time since they've been using the tool. I would be looking at, um, what type of team they're managing. I would start to try and figure out what, if at all, there's some type of hook where they got to some place that's better for them you know, at, by using the tool. So we did this at one point. There was a person that was able to like save a patient that they thought was literally going to die. And they had this moment where it was like, wow, this thing really made a difference for me. And they were very, and we were able to identify that because the patient's family actually messaged us and said, thank you. And then we could reach out to the hospital and they were so open to doing that exact story because they had some type of, you know, attachment to the product. And so I would look for some type of attachment to the product, whether it's through a promotion or something else that they accomplished. And the second thing that I might, and then I would reach out to them. And I would see, I would try and understand their story better. So I would, I would just mainly help them communicate their story and then say, wow, like one of the things that I've been framing it as is, wow, it would be, um, I'm sure it would be really helpful to all of your peers if they were able to understand all the things that you've been able to accomplish with this tool and, and make it more of a, you are helping your peers than you're promoting my company because they are. Um, and then you just have to use the asset in the right way that you've positioned it if it actually gets done. So that's one thing. Um, I've had a lot of success approaching it that way. As you get to larger companies and bigger brands, there's more and more roadblocks. We've talked about that on a previous episode. Um, but those are some ideas that I would consider. And then after what G said, it's like, it's what's in it for them. And so like, I've had, uh, I was able to have Josh Braun at the first event that I decided to do in Miami, like Josh Braun was on it. Josh Braun's a pretty popular guy. And, um, and he did it because he mainly films his videos with zoom or a podcast. And what I offered him was we're going to have two people from Hollywood fly out and film you for 90 minutes. And then you can use that as the content. And that was enough for him. And so, um, I would just, encourage you to continue to try and figure out what's important to the company or what's important to the person that works at the company. 
Yeah, agreed. I don't mm-hmm. have much more to add to that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Cool. So let's uh, jump to Evan. He's got a good one. It's kind of a follow up on the Instagram stuff. If I can find him, here we go. Evan, what's up, man? What's happening, gents? How you doing? Doing great. Uh, could use a shave and a haircut. Other than that, all good. Um, yeah. So. I was following up, um, I guess, you know, so G was saying he does, uh, I like the play um, where he's um, taking a free trial and then retargeting from like a, a, I'm using a, I'm sorry, a product page to retarget towards a a free trial. Was curious, you know, as a, as a service, what would make more sense as a CTA um, where I'm going to get my most uh, bang for buck and, you know, really not trying to, spray and pray, really trying to identify the top, you know, one, two, three, uh, next customers, you know, every so often it's not a heavy, uh, investment. So I can jump in on this one at first. So I think that the, the reason that the free trial retargeting works is because there's no friction. And so you've already shown interest, you swipe up, you put in a couple of details and you're in the app. However, for a service-based business, it ends up the free consultation, the free analysis ends up becoming come get a demo. And there's a lot more friction created in that process than the free trial, because once you get the free trial, then product led can take over and in-app notifications and can get people into the usage. And then if you need to put a sales motion behind it, you can. Um, and so I would try and think about how to limit the friction as much as possible. And so this is, I've never tried this. This is just like the first idea that comes to mind is I would have some type of offer that you can accomplish in 10 minutes and have the button say call now and try that. That's like the lowest friction conversion point that I can think of for a service and then just figure out how to deliver the most value that you can in that different time or walk them through getting set up to whatever analysis that you need to do in that period of time and then say, we'll get back to you. I, th- I think there's a fine line here between offering a free ad analysis and making it a free discovery for your to sell. And so I would really position it as like, we're going to do the analysis. What we typically find, and I mean, I say this to some extent, what we typically find is we can save companies 30% of their money. And if you want to just take the, the recommendations and go and do it yourself, that's great. And then, and that's kind of how I position it. But those are some of the ideas that are floating at the top of my mind. Yeah. I mean, I don't have much more to add than that, Chris. I think you nailed it. Cool. All right. Now it's funny. Once we start getting rolling, all the, all the messages start flowing in. Um, Evan, good to see you, man. Hope you're doing well. Yeah, yeah. Evan and I used to work together. Oh, no way. Yeah. Maybe that's a, maybe that's how I know Evan. He's a good guy. You're the, you're the connector. You're the connector. Okay, so let's see if we can get one more in and then, you know, we're coming up on time. So there's like, there's a lot of chat going on here. You got anything, G, that we can close on? Well, maybe. Yeah. Uh, so everyone, as Chris, I'm sorry to do this shameless, shameless plug coming up, but, uh, uh, Joshua, um, Giardino and I are hosting, uh, a session on Aaron Ross's predictable revenue on Thursday, uh, called demand generation in a skeptical world. Um, I did put the link in the chat, um, in case anyone wants to show up to that, you can just go and sign up there. Um, it's hosted by Aaron Ross's predictable revenue company. Um, and yeah, so I, I agreed that I would promote a little bit. So I did some shameless promoting there. Sorry about that. But if you do want to learn more about demand generation in a skeptical world, uh, my, my colleague Joshua and I will be, um, ripping that to shreds quite in depth on Thursday. So check that out. Um, but in terms of closing, maybe we can riff off of that topic a little Mm, bit, right? Like why? Yeah. Like the reason why I came up with how to do demand generation in a skeptical world is because it is a skeptical world. (laughs) Let's, let's just be real. Like everything is skeptical now in marketing. When I get a cold email, my first thought is this a scam? 
whenever I, mm. <laughs> whenever I get a cold DM on LinkedIn or Twitter or Instagram, my first thought, is this a scam? Like the first thing I'm trying to do is like, assess what is the potential that this is a scam um you know when i'm reading reviews about anything online is these are these reviews fake did someone you know basically hire some agency or company to inflate my this company's ratings like how legit when i look at glassdoor and i see ceo is recommended 100 percent of the time five stars is that bullshit or is it legit when i look at someone's profile on linkedin for the first time, uh, someone wants to connect with me. The first thing I'm trying to assess is how legit is this person? Is this someone that I should know? Or is this person, you know, just like uh, a low quality leech in some way? Are they trying to get something out of me? Um, or, or is this somebody that is potentially going to be a good person to have in my network? Even if there's no, no nothing for me to gain from them, that's fine. But are they at least like on a neutral playing field in terms of just are they good intentioned or, or, or not? Right. So um, how this I think translates to brands in the world of COVID is like, you have a lot of tone deaf stuff happening, unfortunately. And um, I think there are some smart brands that are, that address this crisis kind of head on and did a great job with it. One brand that comes to mind is hotels.com. Uh, they had a uh, captain obvious uh, ad, which said, don't book hotels right now. We're a hotel company, but we are telling you, do not book hotel, uh, hotels, right? Like don't go on vacation, stay home. Like don't play around. Um, you have companies like Kroger and Publix that are buying up all the excess dairy products that are not being used and, and donating it. Um, and, and donating food that's going to go to waste, um, because no one's buying it. They're buying it and donating it to like food banks and homeless shelters. Right. So, um, there are a lot of ways that I think brands can, um, kind of address the crisis head on and not try to, you know, hide in the, in the shadows or act like it's not happening. Um, but it does take bold and thoughtful brands to do that. Um, there's a lot more I could riff on here, but maybe Chris, I'll pause a lot for some reaction. I'm sure you have a few, few things, you know, going off in your mind right now. Yeah. So around 2016, I was selling to hospitals. I was marketing into hospitals and I was doing a survey and, I wanted to understand how people bought things. And so the questions that I asked, the couple of ones that came to mind is, when you first are researching new technology, what do you do? And the number one by far answer was research online. And what we were doing was we were setting up a demo. First step, okay? And so I saw some misalignment there, but the next one I think was super important for this one. It's what do you do next? And next it was, I reach out to a friend or colleague to understand their experience before the demo. And so I started to take that insight. And I, I, if you're on my email list, you got this one from last week, which is that m way more transactions in B2B happen based on word of mouth than anyone understands. You can put together your best buying journey ever with all your different touch points and all these different things. Word of mouth drives way more business than I think any other channel by far, but nobody attributes it that way. And so what I started to do was I started to create an ecosystem in my marketing that facilitated word of mouth. And so we would start to run ads to respiratory therapists and then one respiratory therapist would tag another one or one person would say, this is the best product, we switched to it six months ago and then this happened. Or all of these different things that started to get people talking. And that's why I think that the content, at, content delivered through paid social is a great way because it creates word of mouth and internal discussions, which then gives people the opportunity to reach out to a friend or colleague and understand their experience. So like if I'm looking at a tool, you know, I might reach out to G and be like, Hey, have you used this before? Or if someone shows me an ad and it looks cool, like I'm probably not going to be the one that converts in a demo, but I might ask somebody that I trust. And so that's a re I think a unique kind of like perspective on how to, you know, how to get over some of the skepticism in the world right now. Dude, I love it. Chris, let's, let's do a rapid fire thing where like, I'll just, <laughs> okay. I'll, yeah. I'll just like, I'll, love it. <laughs> I will name something and you tell me what company comes to mind first. Company. A company Gosh. or brand comes to okay. mind first. Let's okay. see what companies have done a good job with like branding and staying top of mind. All right, here we go. Um, Best email marketing tool? HubSpot. 
I don't know. I just don't, I don't care. I don't <laughs> care about email. But the fact that you said that is, in, is interesting. Yeah. All right, let's keep going. Best SEO software. Semrush. Best advertising optimization solution. I do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, we'll do, I guess we'll do, a, we'll do a few more. Um, best landing page testing tool. Uh, optimizely. Okay. Um, best reporting tool for marketers. Mm. I get most of my stuff done through HubSpot and Salesforce, man. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, same here. I'm Salesforce. Google Analytics. Um, couple more. Um, your favorite productivity tool. Asana. Right on. I was going to say best project management tool, but I think you nailed that there. Mm -hmm. um, an app that you use every day that you can't live without. LinkedIn. All right. That's all I got. <laughs> yeah, that was dope. I got, got some brand shout outs there. I, if I had the questions, I would read them back to you, but maybe you can just do it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a tool junkie. Uh, I'm more about doing the fundamentals the right mm -hmm. way. Like you can replace with me, like replace, you know, HubSpot with anything and it'll be the same result. Re replace Pardot with anything. It'll be the same result. Replace Asana with Trello. It'll be the same result. Um, it doesn't matter for me. It's all about actually doing the work. 100%. And I think that, uh, I think that I have a new like t set of homework for next week, which is to try and bring a different, like, I, I love that. I, I raise your hand if that you thought that was like a cool little mix up in the show. Okay. We got some hands. Nice. So I have some homework to deliver some type of new, you know, approach or framework to keep this more interesting. So I'll have that next week. Yeah. I, I was, I was going to suggest maybe a pricing page teardown of some random SaaS company. That might be fun. Mm -hmm. Or, or, a, or a homepage or a landing page. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be cool for everyone. That might be fun. Yeah. Where we just like search a random term, click on their ads, you know, cost some companies a ton of money for no reason. <laughs> click, yeah. <laughs> click on their paid search ads and uh, we'll tear down their content. That sounds fun. We can also crowdsource right now. So if you guys have any ideas that are cooler than the ones that we came up with, feel free to shoot GRI a DM on LinkedIn and we'll, uh, we'll put some ideas together. So again, thank you everyone. Really appreciate, uh, appreciate you. We're trying to keep this fresh and interesting. Um, so if you guys have any like, like the tools thing is new. Like we, we, we don't, we haven't spent a bunch of time on the tools. So maybe that's something we dive into. Um, and just, uh, yeah, really appreciate you guys dedicating you know, somewhere between 60 and 90 minutes every Tuesday to learn. I hope you guys are getting a lot out of it. Um, I know that a couple people that have been on here have gone on to start a podcast, start to get, you know, more active on LinkedIn, start to get inbound job opportunities from other companies. And that's, those are the things that we're trying to make happen here. So the first step is to, to get the information, have the right information and the right strategy. Second step is to start doing it. And then over time, as you start doing it, you're not going to need us anymore. You're going to be, you're going to be the expert. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. Like I hope a year from now, if we're still doing this, that none of the people on here um, are here because they feel like they have to. Hopefully it's because you just like us, <laughs> but, um, yeah, if you're not learning anything and you're here for a year straight, I mean, that, oh man, that means something's not right. But in any case, you know, I'm having fun. Um, I'm sure Chris, you're having fun as well. And it's good. Oh, to yeah. have you guys. Appreciate you all. Hope you have a great night and hope to see you next week. Definitely. Take care, everyone. See ya. Later, Chris. See you, man. Good to see you again. Yeah, bro. Peace out. Love it every time.